everyone. Thanks so much for being with us for this week's edition of the Financial Game Plan with Skip Kelly. I'm Rebecca Powers. Along with you, I learn something every week, Skip. So many people love how dry and straightforward and no nonsense you are. <laughs> Have you always been that way? I think so. <laughs> Blunt is probably the best way to put it, but dry, that's, that's absolutely. I mean, come on. If it makes sense, I'm a very common sense guy. Right, and it's best to be blunt. I think that's what most of us crave. When things start getting a little bit, you know, crazy or iffy, and they take the further away you get from simple, the crazier I get. I, I just can't go there. There's so many things that don't make sense on this planet anymore, never mind in, in the financial world. Let's keep things simple so we all know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. That's so true, and that's really the And you can do that. It's it easy to do. You can. You say many times, you know, financial planning and really planning forward is not rocket science. And that's kind of been one of your pet peeves, I think, that we've all been conditioned to let them talk over our heads like we don't know what's going on. So simplicity is the biggest thing that you love to share. How many times do I have potential clients come in and they've got advisors, one or multiple, they've had them for years and years, and when they come in and they drop their statements on, we get to the point where we determine, let's have a, a second meeting, then I'll look at their statements and finances and things of that nature, so we have something to talk about in that second meeting. And when I look at what they have, and I ask them, what is this? How are you using it? Why did you get into this instrument in the first place? What's the goal? When are you gonna utilize it for income, or are you not? Is this for legacy? Or when I ask these folks, is they have no idea. It, it's just one out of multiple other instruments that they have in their portfolio. Mm. They have no idea what they're doing. And again, as I mentioned, what, why, and how they're doing it. It's simple stuff. Let's understand all of that. That's the only way I know to give our clients peace of mind. And I tell you what, that's what makes us the greatest business on the planet Earth, because unlike my father who was a stockbroker back in the 60s, 70s, and some of the 80s, his life was predicated on what the markets were doing, going mm -hmm. up and down. When the markets mm -hmm. were up, life was so good for him. And he was happy and jovial. Life was good. There was pressures were low. But when the markets come down, which anybody who knows history at all knows, the 70s were horrendous and the 80s were very turbulent. And his life was horrifying. Every single time a phone rings, what do you suppose the people on the other end want to ask him? Right. And what does a stockbroker have for an answer? Nothing. They have no guarantees that they can give you. So I want my clients to understand that, yes, we're going to have monies in the market. We're going to be aggressive with those monies in the market, but we're not leaving it all in there in retirement unless you like ulcers. If you like <laughs> ulcers, then go ahead. But don't call me when the market's down. We're going to take a significant portion of your the wealth that you've accumulated over the years, and we're going to make some of that money safe and create income with it to augment the monies that you have in the market. And the monies in the market, they're there for the long-term best growth that we can get. And the only time we will touch those accounts, come hell or high water, regardless of where the markets are, the only time we'll touch them is when the markets are high and giving and you're making profit. We never touch our market accounts in a good plan when the markets are down. That's insane. But if you get to broker, ask him, okay, what are we going to do differently when the markets uh, pull back? We just saw a 30% pullback, Rebecca. That took us two years to get back to even. Okay, that was quick because the last two pullbacks that we have uh, or had in 2001, the markets came down 46%. It took six and a half years to get back to even. And then when we finally got back to even after six and a half years, 2007 comes along. It took five and a half years to get back to even after that 50 plus percent dip. So we do not want to have to rely on our enjoyment of our retirement based on what the market movement is. That is not a recipe for success. And it certainly isn't a recipe for peace of mind. It's just like going to the casino. You're actually, it feels like gambling. So well, it is. Your money is on red. Monies that you have yeah. in the market. I want all my clients. We manage tens of millions of dollars of monies of our clients in the market. The question is how much of your portfolio should be riding that monies in the market. We just do not want to ever have to take monies out of our markets when the markets are down in order to augment our social security and maintain our lifestyle. That's not a good plan, but Rebecca, 95% of the population, that's what their plan is. That's what they're, they're on. Hoping, mm -hmm. hoping that Cross they're going to be okay. And such a great lesson you learned from your dad just from watching him, watching <laughs> the stress. He was just a broker. So that's just the person that's trading and everything on your um, your sheet with, you, with your stocks and bonds. Well, I, I just want to mention something that's kind of yeah. cute there because 
as a kid, I grew up in Lexington for the most part, but we owned a cottage colony up in Moultonboro uh, in New Hampshire. And uh, we ended up moving there in, right in the middle of high school. But I can tell you that every room of that house up in Moultonboro and even up in the office, in the dump truck, on the lawnmower, we had six acres to mow, 14 buildings to paint, and 230 foot of beach to rake every day. Okay, we were indentured servants as kids. But <laughs> in every one of those areas, there was a little light blue bottle with white lettering on there. What do you suppose those white letters spelled on those little blue bottles that were everywhere in that house? Water? <laughs> Go back to work? <laughs> Don't be a bum. I don't know. <laughs> no. Oh, geez. What the heck? Now that I'm, I'm spacing it here. Not <laughs> Maybe we should take that. a break and yeah. let you guess on our break what you think that word is. Yeah. The number is 844. Well, oh, go ahead. It's the white version of Pepto-Bismol. What the heck is that? <laughs> oh, milk and magnesia? Oh, uh, you're, you're close. Let's just say <laughs> it was there to help his tummy. He needed support. That's right, because the ulcers, yeah, I know. It's the peace of mind that we all want. And how do you get anywhere without a game plan? That's why we call this show the Financial Game Plan. The offer today from Skip, if you call us during this break, anytime during this broadcast, or you can go online and you can even point your phone to that QR code. It'll take you straight to a landing page. Have your calendar ready. We want to make sure you get that one-on-one -on -one with Terra Firma. Uh, and the coolest part is there truly is no obligation. There's no cost. It means absolutely free that first appointment. More with Skip Kelly, some great insight and great stories right after this. <laughs> I've been involved in finance and real estate my entire career since 1982. I was brought to my knees financially in 2007, 8, and 9 when the markets pulled back 56%. And I uh, determined then and there that that would never happen to me again. I started in different areas uh, in the insurance industry, finding niches that worked better, became an income planner, got my securities license and things of that nature. So now we're a holistic financial advisor and we, we're income planners. We help our clients figure out how they're gonna get from where they were to where they need to be in order to retire with peace of mind. Probably more than 90% of the people, this is their plan. They cross their fingers and hope. They do what they've been told to do all their life. Just keep shoveling monies into the market and you'll be great. They hope, hope, hope that everything will go well, that there won't be any major pullbacks and things of that nature. That's not a plan. We try to do every component that you need to have done in retirement preparation. Uh, we want to make sure that you've got your income plan, You've got your assets properly allocated. You've got a tax plan, long-term care and health planning, and then finally, the legacy planning. Our clients love us, we love them, we make a fabulous living, and we know that we put our clients in, into a better situation than they were when they met us. Welcome back. He just mentioned legacy planning in that spot, so let's go there. Is legacy and estate planning the same thing, Skip? Well, it is in my book. I mean, what are you trying to do? You're trying to figure out how you want to leave this planet, how you want it, the, the different things that you want to have take place and the transition of your assets and income streams and things of that nature upon your demise. So that's really what we're talking about here. I've always thought if you had a will that you were set. But oh, you made sure. me realize today, actually, that that's not a trust. Yeah, well, you're not alone in that, Rebecca. I think everyone pretty much thinks that, hey, I'm probably okay. I'm not a multimillionaire. I don't need a revocable trust or any other kind of trust. I think what you'll find is that if you've got assets, you're probably better off doing a revocable trust. What does a will guarantee? It guarantees one thing. It guarantees probate. <laughs> probate can be expensive, and it can be very time-consuming. Uh, especially for the person that's handling um, your portfolio after you're gone. So uh, we want to do things a little bit differently. Most people do need to do a revocable trust if you've got any assets that you plan on leaving behind. The whole idea is, is that you want to make sure that whatever your goals are come to fruition in retirement. Whatever assets you want to leave to different people, get where you want them to go, and as soon as possible with the least expense. And that can only happen with a trust if you've got significant assets. And you said irrevocable trust, so no one can go in and poke holes in it later like you well, could with a will? I said revocable trust, oh. uh, but irrevocable trusts are a horse of another color. Oh. And that's something that, again, um, I am not the attorney. Peter Katrubis is our uh, 
estate planning attorney in our office. He also does taxes. He's a uh, has a tax, a master's in taxation. So we'll do our clients' taxes also. But all of our clients, you know, whether you want to have us do your taxes, that's optional. But if you need to have a, a legacy plan, in other words, a revocable trust, typically, then you would sit with Peter. Uh, we do this all in house, and because we try to do everything both financially and legally in house to make it easy for our clients to do everything under one roof. And Peter Katrubis does that for us right in our office. And it's very, very simple. If it makes sense for you to look into this thing, then you'll fill out a survey and it'll ask a whole bunch of questions. So it gets you thinking properly about how you want these assets to move after you're gone. And then once you, uh, we get that survey back, you'll sit with Peter for probably an hour or so and, and then determine does it make sense uh, to do a, a trust of any, of any manner. But ordinarily, it's going to be a revocable trust for lots of reasons, which I'll let Peter explain to you because I'm not the attorney. <laughs> but I can tell you that uh, almost all trusts, 95% plus, are going to be revocable trusts, not irrevocable. Okay. You mentioned the word probate. And for those of you who don't know, probate can take a long time, can be very expensive. The lawyers and the courts make the money. It can also put your children or whoever you're leaving your money to in a holding pattern in some type of turmoil. Does the trust completely get rid of probate? It, it, the revocable trust, yes, it can. It'll, it'll lock that out. A perfect example, and I tell it a lot in my dinner seminars, is one of my clients, uh, they have, uh, well, there's four siblings. My client is the third youngest female, and their parents owned, or they, they owned, a very, very expensive, it's almost $4 million or so right now in value for this house up on the beach in Saco, Maine. And they had a will, and the whole idea was that place was going to be sold upon the demise of the second uh, parent, and it was going to be split four ways for the kids to do what they wanted to do. And what happened was, because it was only in a will and it did not have a revocable trust, the youngest daughter could not understand, could just could not bear to sell that property up to the beach. She'd been going there ever since she was knee high to a grasshopper and uh, loved the whole thing and wanted to bring her kids up there. Well, you know, her siblings didn't agree. I mean, if you're gonna get a significant chunk of dough coming in upon the demise of your second parent, none of us are looking forward uh, to losing our parents, but we probably have a reasonable idea of what we wanna do with some of those monies. Maybe we wanna pay off our kids' education loans, Maybe we want to buy a condo in Florida. Maybe we want to pay off the note on our mortgage uh, at home. We probably have a pretty good idea what we want to do with that money. But four years later now, because the youngest daughter, and I used it before, took a stick and stuck it in the spokes of that plan, threw everything off, and four years later, they still own that house. Uh, the other three siblings, how do you think that they feel about their youngest sibling mm. who's, who's holding up the works on all of this stuff? It is Horrifying. Terrible. And how do you think their relationship is now? And then their children Terrible. with their cousins, it'll be tension. That's, that's not what their parents wanted. But here's that's what I want you to think about. What about the parents who were the sweetest, nicest yeah. parents on the planet? They, they, they thought they had done a good job planning. They're floating around in the clouds <laughs> up there looking down going, what have we done, Martha? What have right. we done? We broke our family apart because we saved a couple of grand not doing the legal work that we needed to get done on the front end. It's sad. It's a very sad story. So are they going through court? Are they oh, yeah, fighting? They're in probate. They're, spending they're in probate money. four years now. And think about the expense. <sighs> My in-laws live up about two or three miles south of them in Bitterford in Maine on, on the coast. I know how much expensive it is to maintain a house on the beach. Forget the cost of the house. To maintain a house on the beach, it's monumentally expensive. That house is getting beat on by sand, wind, rain, salt, seagull, poo, yeah. you name it. It's, <laughs> there's a lot of work being done, and there's always, you know, just like we had the last, uh, the last few weeks, we had some major, major storms, washed a lot of beach property. It's just something that these kids now, they've got to stress about until they can finally get this... Yeah. Uh, this property sold. And it's probably, nobody knows how much longer it's gonna to take to get it through probate, but right now, it's, it's 
driving everybody nuts. That's and it's completely avoidable if they'd done it right. And the, the parents would, would be sitting down looking comfortably yes. down, seeing what's going on with their family now. And right now, they have to be sick to their stomachs. And think about property taxes every year that they have to pay. And who's fight? They're fighting over that, too, probably. All of that. The maintenance, the taxes, the plowing, the mowing. The painting, it just never ends. Yeah, and it, it comes from a place of emotion. I'm the youngest of six, and my mom passed away. We didn't want to sell. Four of my brothers wanted to, and my sister and I didn't want to. Luckily, we didn't have a lot of money, and it was a tiny <laughs> house. So one of my nephews said, I'll buy it, and so we still have our home. But it's true. It's like if you have a lot and you worry, you don't want it to, to come between your children. Absolutely not. You know, that's the whole idea of doing proper planning. Yeah. So that when you're gone, you leave things better than, than they were when you <laughs> got here. I mean, that, that's the hope, right? That we can help out our families and put them in the best possible position going and forward. And even when you talk about tax planning, Skip, you always say, mm. okay, you get a plan and then you're going to leave your child a million dollars. Did you think about the tax bracket? Like some children actually, you have hurt them, right? Yeah. You, you have, because you haven't done it properly. We've so. talked about that, that before too. Of course, yeah. we're talking about everything multiple, multiple times. <laughs> yeah. But the key here is this. Think about this for just a second because I have this going on in, in one portion of my family. Uh, someone has some significant wealth and their income is very, very, very low. In other words, they could do Roth conversions very inexpensively, but when they die, that money's gonna go to their kids. Most of it's qualified money, which means it's never been taxed. And when it goes to the kids, it's gonna be taxed at the kids' tax level. So instead of a 12% tax, they're gonna be in the 22, 24, 35% tax bracket. If the, if the, in this particular case, the parent had done the Roth conversions, all of that money would have come over tax-free. So there are certain things that you need to get done. Most people don't have a clue what to do or how to do it or even why to do it. Yeah. And in fact, I can't tell you how many times I get the, well, I'm 68, I'm 73, I'm 75. Why would I want to do Roth conversions? Well, I just gave you one perfect example of about 3,000 that I could give you in the next hour. Get it done. I don't care if you're 95 years old. Get those monies converted to Roth. So, if you were gonna receive a gift, okay, would you rather receive a tax-free gift or a gift that was gonna require you to pay taxes at your income tax rate? It's a no-brainer. Thank you anyway. <laughs> a ticking tax time bomb is what you're describing. All right, if you want that first appointment, it truly is absolutely free. There is no obligation. It is really that simple to give us a call, 844-823-6398. There's also that QR code, and uh, this could be the hour that changes your life, truly. And it might just be a second opinion. You might just be right on track and they'll tell you that as well. All right, more with Skip Kelly and mapping out your financial game plan in just one minute. As a good saver, you've been putting away money during your working years. Studies find that the biggest fear of retirees is running out of money. Market volatility isn't just the downward movement of stock prices, it's the size and frequency of change. The more dramatic the ups and downs, the higher the volatility. This can put savers who are newly retired or a few years away from being retired at greater risk. Today's generation of retirees is not receiving traditional pensions as our parents or grandparents did. Instead, we have retirement accounts such as 401ks or 403bs. These accounts typically expose your money to market risk. The last thing you want right before retirement is to lose a portion of the money you need for income. But how do you turn these accounts into a retirement income? Is it safe to keep all your retirement money sitting in the stock market? The last thing you want is to lose a portion of the money you need for income due to market loss. By working with a financial professional, you can learn how to turn a portion of your savings into an income stream for life and income for the life of your spouse if you're married. We all have moments in our lives when we wish we had taken action sooner. Don't let procrastination rain on your retirement parade. Act now before it's too late. Please call our office to set up your no-cost, no-obligation retirement income review today. Welcome back. Last segment, we were talking about legacy and how important it is to leave more to your loved ones than you're going to leave to the federal government. So I think we can all agree how very, very important that is. While we're talking about taxes, let's talk about RMDs, required minimum distribution. Has the age changed? What is the age now? And why do we have to do it? RMDs, that's, a, that's an interesting topic. Everyone's all excited about that topic. 
<laughs> First of all, I have to go back. Maalox, the little blue bottles that were all over my father's. Finally, sorry, my brain was a little slow here this morning. Maalox. You don't want to have to take that if you don't need it. His dad was a stockbroker. If you missed the first part of the show, he was just doing stocks. So he had to drink Maalox every day, all day because of the uncertainty. And that's why you went holistic, independent fiduciary. You're not just a broker. Oh, You're not just under one big flagship. I knew as in my youth that there was no way I wanted to do what my father did. He made a fantastic living and a very respected, you know, working for Merrill Lynch in Boston way back in those days, but uh, I wouldn't have traded that. I knew I needed to do something different. And the way that we do business is light years different. Yes. And we never have any of that animosity in our office because not everything is hanging on the market in order for us to have a good relationship. We give you something that most clients most people, before they come see us and become clients, never have financial peace of mind. And when you're utilizing both segments of the financial industry, the safe money side with the insurance companies and the risk money side with the markets, then you can put a real cohesive plan together. But let's get back to the RMDs here, Rebecca, that you asked about. What the heck is an RMD? RMD is a required minimum distribution. When you get old and gray, sooner or later, you're going to have to pay taxes. Uncle Sam wants his cut. Uh, he, he's patient, patient, patient for decades while you're building up wealth in your company-sponsored plans, your 401k, 403bs, 457s, TSPs. They're all really the same kind of company-sponsored plan where you can put away a bunch of dough, but you haven't paid taxes on it. You've deferred your tax. You kicked the tax can down the road. At some point, Uncle Sam wants in on some of that. He's not going to wait until the day that you die before he starts participating in your gains over the years. So. At 73 now, you have to start taking RMDs, required minimum distributions, out of those and only those accounts. And when I say those, I'm talking about deferred tax accounts. So at 73, it used to be 70 and a half just a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, but it got bumped out to 72 and then 73 over the last couple of years. So the RMD at 73 now, you've got to start taking a small portion of your wealth out of that in aggregate total of your company sponsor plans or deferred uh, instruments that you haven't paid taxes on. Right now, that percentage is less than 4%. Use 4% because that will be the initial, roughly the initial percentage you'll, you'll have to take out of it. Let's just say you had a million dollars in those deferred tax instruments. You'd have to take out about $40,000. The true number at age 73 is 3.91%. Hmm. So if you take out 4%, 40,000 of that million dollars that you have in qualified monies that you owe taxes on, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a penalty. Many people think it's a penalty. It's not a penalty. You're just paying taxes on a small portion of the wealth that you've accumulated. So that's your RMD. And every single year, that percentage goes up a little bit from 3.91%. It goes up a few basis points. By the time you're 90, it's closer to 10% every year that you have to take out and pay taxes on. But what can you do with that money? You can do whatever you want with it. Take the family to Disney World. You can put a new roof on, a new kitchen in. You can put the money in another investment. There's all sorts of things you can do with it. It's not a penalty. It's just something you have to be aware of and make sure you do take care of it because if you don't, you'll be penalized. And that's why in your financial plan, you do all of these different paths and scenarios because if you've, like you've done thousands of uh, Roth conversions, if most of that money has already been taxed, then you have less to take from that's when you're right. 70 or 80. That's right. We, our, our RMDs will be reduced, but in my perfect plan, you won't have any monies that you'll have to take RMDs from because we will already will have, over the years, converted all of our deferred uh, tax monies, converted them and got them into our Roth accounts where they're now percolating year over year tax free. It's the end all be all. It's what we all want to really have happen. So in yeah. my world, you won't have any qualified money by the time you get to retire uh, RMD age. You yeah. will already have converted all of those funds. And the sooner the better. I mean, you always, always say, when should I start retiring? Yesterday, even if you're 25. I mean, the longer ramp you have, the more you can do and the more money you'll have. When would you rather start building up tax-free gains? Now, 10 years ago, <laughs> or 10 years in the future? 10 years ago, right? We want every dime that we can get gains on, we want those gains to be tax-free. 
And the reason you need time for Roth conversions, you've taught us, is because you can only do a certain percentage each year, right? Well, actually, you can or do the whole boatload. You can you actually, can? Yeah, all the tea in China, every dime that you have, you can convert in one year. The problem is, is that you won't because it's going to negatively affect you. Gotcha. If you do You'll that, pay more. all of that money that you converted is going to go on top of your income. Gotcha. And it's going to bump you into a higher tax bracket. So we have to be cognizant of not bumping you into a higher tax. Sometimes I don't care. Bumping from the 22% tax bracket to the 24% tax bracket, I don't necessarily care about that. The 2% is chump change in the big picture. It's jumping from the 24% tax bracket to the 32% tax bracket. We want to avoid like the plague, right? So that's why we do it in chunks year over year and try to get the whole thing done as soon as we possibly can. Some people, it's going to take us forever to get it done because they've got so much money put away tax deferred. Other people, it takes two, three, four, five years. Right. But let's get the ball rolling before the taxes do go up, which I think we talked about earlier today. Yeah, and as you said, you have to know the exact amount. Let's say, okay, you've got seven years, Susie Q. All right, let's do this exact amount to convert to give you the best tax. And that's what planning is about. And you always say, I don't know what you do for a living, and you shouldn't have to know everything that I do for a living. Yeah, it, what we talk about that with every single client in our annual reviews, that's the big topic of conversation, is how much should we convert this year? All right. How much does it make sense without bumping ourselves up into a higher tax bracket, but also understanding that we have to have the money to pay for those conversions, the, the tax money to pay for those conversions. And we don't want to take, we do not want to pay the taxes with the monies that came out of our IRA. We want the long dollar to get every dollar in the IRA. We want to end up into the Roth. So we will pay the taxes with money out of our back pocket, out of our bank accounts or right. some other accounts, but not with our uh, deferred uh, tax monies that we've got accumulated. Just like you say, you don't want to take money out of your portfolio to live on. You need to make sure your income is handled because there's that compounding loss and people tend to work on emotions, get nervous and want to sell and then they lose more and then they compound more loss. We only have a minute left in the show. Yeah, well, you know, we want to keep emotions out of it. With a good plan, there is no emotion. In fact, I get, I, the perfect way to do this thing, if you can do it, not everybody can do it, is, is to not care if the markets go up or markets go down. Because if the markets go up, fantastic. Take the profits off, okay? When you're young, you leave your profits in there and you want to grow, grow, grow. But when you're getting close to retirement, take those profits off and make them safe. Do something intelligent with them. Absolutely. The intelligent first step is having a financial game plan. If you don't have a plan in writing for the rest of your life through retirement, covering everything that we talk about on this show, get that first appointment with Skip Kelly and Terra Firma. It's a family business. His beautiful daughter, uh, Cody, will hold your hand through Medicare, which a lot of people are scared of. As he said, they have an attorney that does strictly legacy planning. It's all about you, and we hope to meet you. Give us a call. We'll see you next week.